afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming along um, to this lecture. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Shona Wilson-Stark, um, one of the lecturers in public law here in the faculty. Um, so it's a pleasure to welcome you to this event, which is hosted by the Centre for Public Law um, and designed to discuss the constitutional implications of the Continuity Bill case. Um, so for constitutional lawyers in the audience, you might remember we mentioned this case in Lecture 20, towards the end of Michaelmas term, um, but we were waiting to find out what might happen. And now we know what's happened, um, and we need to bring you up to date um, with the outcome of the case. And that might be the same for students in other um, subjects, perhaps any EU lawyers um, and others who want to be updated on what happened. Um, so this event is primarily aimed at students in the audience, and it's very um, important that you, know, you start to think about any questions you might want to ask at the end of the presentations. So you're very lucky today to hear from three members of the faculty who will all give you um, their digest of important aspects of the case. So I'm just going to introduce them now, and then we'll hear from them in turn. Each of them will speak for 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time to hear from you. So first of all, we will hear from Professor Mark Elliott, who is a professor of public law in the faculty, um, also deputy chair of the faculty board and a fellow of St. Catherine's College. After that, we'll hear from Professor Alison Young, who is the Sir David Williams Professor of Public Law and who is a fellow of Robinson College. And then last, but by no means least, Dr. Paul Daly, who is a senior lecturer in public law and a fellow of Queen's College. Um, so without any further ado, we'll start with Professor Elliot. Okay, well, thank you, Shona, and thanks to you all for coming along uh, today. What I'm going to do is to speak for about a quarter of an hour and try to give you an overview of the case itself in terms of the legal and political background that led up to it and then what the Supreme Court actually decided. And then uh, my colleagues will focus on more specific um, aspects and implications of the, of the judgment. So let's start with some uh, background. Uh, why did this case um, end up in the Supreme Court and, and what was the case um, about? Um, I'll suggest at the end that the genesis of the case probably goes back to, to Miller and, and the whole of, of that sort of episode, but the immediate background of the case is the uh, European Union Withdrawal Act 2018, uh, or the Withdrawal Bill as it was when this all sort of kicked off. As you will know uh, from uh, constitutional law or other lectures, the, the main thing that the Withdrawal Act does is to attempt to provide for a degree of legal continuity as the UK leaves the um, EU. And so it captures um, the vast majority of EU law, which is in force at 1 minute uh, to, um, I guess it's 11 p.m. on exit day, um, and we then convert that into um, domestic law. Alongside that, it confers very extensive powers on ministers to address so-called deficiencies um, in the statute book arising from withdrawal from the European Union. Now, when this legislation was introduced into the UK Parliament, the devolved administrations in Cardiff and Edinburgh uh, took exception to certain aspects of it. And they had a number of objections to it. They said that in general, the bill fundamentally cut across the principles of the devolution settlements. Why? Well, in part because they said that the UK powers being vested in ministers could be used to make provision in policy areas which were the responsibility of Scottish or Welsh ministers. And alongside that... The limitations in the devolution statutes that stop devolved action in breach of EU law would be turned into restrictions on not going against retained EU law, which the devolved government saw as a new limitation on um, devolved authority. 
In the light of all of that, um, the Holyrood Parliament in Scotland refused to give legislative consent to the Withdrawal Act, and yet, nevertheless, it was passed by the UK Parliament. And this was the first time uh, that this had occurred, where there'd been a clear refusal in Scotland to grant consent, and yet the UK Parliament went ahead anyway and enacted um, the bill. Um, in Wales, there was a, a ultimately an accommodation, and the Welsh Government in the end recommended consent, so Wales in the end did consent, but Scotland didn't. So with the UK Parliament pressing ahead with plans that Scotland found unacceptable, the Scottish Parliament retaliated and it introduced its own legislation, which we'll just call uh, the Continuity Bill, because the, the full title is a bit of a mouthful. Now, in some aspects, the, the Continuity Bill does very similar things to the Withdrawal Act. It aims to ensure, as surprise, surprise, given the title of the bill, legal continuity on Brexit. So whereas the Withdrawal Act in sections 2 to 4 preserve EU law, the Continuity Bill provides for the continued operation in Scotland of what it calls devolved EU law. In other words, EU law which impinges on devolved matters. So, so far, the two pieces of legislation are doing very similar things. However, there were also very significant differences between them, and here are some of the, the key differences. The Withdrawal Act, the UK Act, said that the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights would not come across into domestic law when Britain left the EU. But the Scottish Continuity Bill said that the Charter would remain part of Scots law insofar as it pertained to devolved matters. So a, a clear difference in terms of the retention of the Charter. Similarly, whereas the UK legislation said there'd be no right of action in domestic law, arising from general principles of EU law after Brexit, uh, the Scottish Continuity Bill said more or less the opposite. Next, whereas the uh, UK Act said that there'd be no possibility of a claim based on Frankovich damages after exit, the Scottish Continuity Bill said that there would be that possibility if the right of action had accrued prior to exit day. The final difference for now, but there is also a further collision point that I'll come to later, is that whereas Section 8 of the Withdrawal Act authorises UK ministers to deal with deficiencies in the statute book arising from withdrawal, Section 11 of the Continuity Bill provided Scottish ministers with a similar power, but it was framed differently. In some respects it was broader, and in some respects it was narrower, but it wasn't aligned with the power given to UK ministers under Section 8 of the Withdrawal Act itself. So we have the two parliaments on collision course, in the sense that the UK is pressing ahead in spite of the absence of devolved consent, and then the Scottish Parliament retaliates by means of this continuity bill. Another first that this case constitutes is that it's the first time that a case has ended up in the UK Supreme Court about the legislative powers of the Scottish Parliament thanks to a referral by the UK law officers. Section 33 of the Scotland Act allows the UK government to ask the Supreme Court to rule prior to royal assent on whether or not a Scottish bill is within the competence of the Scottish Parliament. And this was the first time this had happened. Let's remind ourselves of what the Scotland Act says about the powers of the Scottish Parliament. Section 28 says that an act of the Scottish Parliament is not law if it's outside competence. And section 28 subsection 2 then lists various grounds on which something would be outside of competence. I've just highlighted the salient ones here. So first, something is outside competence if it relates to reserve matters. And here, it's important to note that international relations is a matter that is reserved to the UK. Second, something is outside Holyrood's competence if it breaches restrictions in Schedule 4 of the Act. 
One of the things that Schedule 4 lists is what are called protected enactments. In other words, they're protected against modification by the Scottish Parliament. And among those protected enactments are much of the Scotland Act itself and, following its enactments, the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. And that's a particularly important point, as we'll see in a moment. Thirdly, some things outside competence if it is incompatible with EU law or, after exit day, if it's incompatible with retained EU law. Finally, but this doesn't appear in Section 28, we know from the judgment of the Supreme Court in AXA that if a Scottish Act of Parliament conflicts with fundamental constitutional principles, then it may be ruled to be outside competence or unlawful on that ground. So that's the legal backdrop against which the UK government brings this matter to the UK Supreme Court and asks it to rule on whether or not uh, the Scottish Parliament has stayed within the boundaries of its powers. So how did the UK government try to argue that the Scottish Parliament had exceeded its competence? I'm going to highlight four grounds of challenge that were brought. Two of them were unsuccessful and two of them were successful. So one of the broader arguments the UK made was that the whole of the Scottish Bill was outside competence because it was all concerned with international relations, relations between the UK and the EU. But the court disagreed. The court said that, in fact, all the bill is doing is regulating the legal consequences in Scotland of the cessation of EU law as a source of domestic law regarding devolved matters. And in that sense, they didn't feel that it engaged the international re relations restriction on Holyrood's powers. So that argument by the UK didn't succeed. That would have taken the whole act out, but it didn't work. The UK government also argued that there were certain aspects of the bill, at least, which engaged the legal certainty or rule of law grounds of challenge, which were made possible by the AXA case. So these are the extra statutory grounds of challenge that don't appear in Section 28 of the Scotland Act itself. However, for reasons best known to the court, it said that the AXA grounds of challenge, these broader constitutional grounds of challenge, are inapplicable in cases brought under Section 33. In other words, these cases that are referred to the court for an opinion prior to royal assent. The AXA grounds, said the court, were only applicable to challenges brought after royal assent, after full enactment. There were also some very curious comments there, which those of you who are administrative lawyers might want to raise at the end in questions, about the difference in the legal status between an act that was found to be to fall foul of the actor grounds as compared to the Section 28 ground, but we'll leave that issue for now. So those two grounds of challenge didn't succeed. But a third ground of challenge did, and that was to do with the sovereignty of the Westminster Parliament and the way in which Section 17 of the Continuity Bill arguably impinged um, on the, the sovereignty of the UK um, Parliament. I'll come back to that point um, in a minute because that's sort of a standalone um, point. Just to complete the picture, the fourth, and in a sense the most successful ground of challenge, was on the ground that the continuity bill, or provisions in it, were incompatible with the EU Withdrawal Act. Now, the Scottish Government argued that the court shouldn't even be looking at this act because it wasn't on the statute book when the Continuity Bill was enacted. But the court said, no, we have to look at the legal position as it is today when the case is actually in front of the court. And at this point in time, the Withdrawal Act is part of the legal picture. The court didn't accept the argument that the whole of the Continuity Bill was inconsistent with or fell foul of the Withdrawal Act, but it did hold that multiple provisions within the Bill were outside of legislative competence because they were inconsistent with the Withdrawal Act. And it didn't matter that the, that the Continuity Bill wasn't trying to explicitly go against the Withdrawal Act. It was sufficient, said the court, 
if it implicitly amended, disapplied or repealed the Withdrawal Act, either in whole or in part. Now, if we go back to my earlier slide where I listed the differences between the two pieces of legislation, we can see that the vast majority of the interesting provisions are now taken out. So the court holds that the continuity bill is invalid in terms of retaining the charter, in terms of retaining the general principles, in terms of the opportunity for Frankovich claims, and in terms of the differential powers given to Scottish uh, ministers. So on all of those grounds, the court holds that the bill is outside of Holyrood's um, competence. That takes me to the Section 17 challenge, or the challenge to Section 17 of the Bill. So let me just explain the background um, to this. As you know, Section 8 of the Withdrawal Act gives UK ministers a very broad power to correct the statute book in the light of deficiencies arising from exit. That power is vested in UK ministers, and importantly, in giving them the power to make secondary legislation amending uh, the, the law, there is no requirement of devolved consent, even if the exercise of that power impinges on areas that engage devolved competence. And this is what the devolved government said was a power grab in the legislation. The Scottish Parliament retaliation was Section 17 of the Continuity Bill. It said that the Section 8 power, insofar as it impinged on devolved matters, could only be exercised, in effect, if the Scottish ministers had consented to it. So whereas the UK legislation gave UK ministers an unconstrained power in this regard, Section 17 sought to insert, in effect, a Scottish veto over UK secondary legislation made under Section 8. And the question was whether or not this was uh, outside the Scottish Parliament's competence. Now, Section 28.7 of the Scotland Act says that Section 28 of the Act, which vests power in the Scottish Parliament, doesn't affect the power of the UK Parliament to make laws for Scotland. And the question, or at least the way in which the question was considered, was whether or not Section 17 of the Continuity Bill was inconsistent with Section 28.7, in a sense the parliamentary sovereignty affirming provision in the Scotland Act 1998. And the court said it was inconsistent and it was therefore outside of competence. Why? Because Section 17, it said, would make the Westminster Parliament incapable of granting a power to UK ministers along the lines of the Section 8 power, which was free from a requirement to obtain Scottish ministers' consent. This, said the court, would amount to a modification of Section 28, subsection 7 of the Scotland Act, 1998. And on that basis, uh, it was held to be outside of competence. Now, Professor Young is going to say some more about um, this whole question, um, I think. But just before I finish, two broader uh, points. Uh, what, standing back from the technicalities of this case, what can we learn from it? Firstly, what does it tell us about parliamentary sovereignty and, and devolution? The Supreme Court is unsparing in its reaffirmation of the sovereignty of the UK Parliament. It says in terms, the UK Parliament remains sovereign. It says that its power in relation to Scotland is undiminished by devolution. And it says that the very essence of a devolved system is that it preserves the powers of the central legislature in relation to all matters, whether devolved or reserved. So in that sense, the judgment is uncompromising. That then raises questions about where does the Sewell Convention fit in and where does Section 28.8 of the Scotland Act fit in, which provides a kind of statutory affirmation or recognition of the Sewell Convention? Well, of course, we know from the Miller case that the Supreme Court doesn't really think much in legal terms of the Sewell Convention. It was very dismissive in Miller of the Sewell Convention. 
And the continuity bill case doesn't provide any different kind of view. Again, by stating the sovereignty of Parliament in these uncompromising terms, it, it leaves little, if any, room for arguing that the Convention is anything more uh, but a political factor which can be taken into account or not, as the UK Parliament um, prefers. I wonder if what we're seeing then is, although the court in Miller refused to rule on the Convention, I wonder if we're seeing a, a phenomenon whereby that very refusal has served to some extent to undermine the Convention and to deprive it of the political resonance that it was invested with um, only a few years ago. And more generally, I wonder if that's contributing to a very significant breakdown in constitutional relations between different parts of the UK. So my very final point is just to read you an extract from um, the legislative consent memorandum that the Scottish Government prepared on the Agriculture Bill, which is currently going through the Westminster Parliament. It doesn't sound like very fertile constitutional territory, however. What the Scottish Government says is, first of all, we don't think that the Agriculture Bill uh, is, is purely on reserve matters. We think it does engage devolved matters, and we don't think the Scottish Parliament should give its consent. However, they said, we are not even prepared to play this game because the UK government has shown itself willing to press ahead with Brexit legislation irrespective of whether or not there is consent. It says the UK government has effectively suspended the Sewell Convention in relation to Brexit legislation and that there's therefore no point in granting consent, given that in their view, withholding consent will make not a blind bit of difference. Now, like all things Brexit-related, we have to be careful because this may prove to be a temporary hiccup in relations between the UK and uh, the devolved um, administrations and parliaments. But there's also the risk that this is the beginning of a very uh, difficult period in constitutional relationships within um, the UK. And I guess that's a reminder that as well as making us look outwards in terms of thinking, as Miller did, about the relationship between UK and EU law, Brexit has also forced us to look in at how our own constitutional system works and we're having to confront some fairly uncomfortable um, parts of our rather ramshackle um, constitutional system. Thank you. Thank you. I just need to deal with... Um, so if I can close this one down. And there we go. So I just have one slide for you to have a look at. There we go, so hopefully you can see that. So what I'd like to do is to build on Professor Elliott's um, excellent presentation and outline of the case and try and relate it to some of the issues that we have within UK constitutional law. And there are three things that I want to think about. The first one I want us to think about is what I've decided to refer to as the sovereignty conundrum. And the sovereignty conundrum comes from these rather lovely paragraphs that I've put up here for you to have a look at. And uh, nicely, they're next to each other. So this is all to do with the issue with, we're back to Clause 17. And the problem we have with Clause 17 in the Scottish Continuity Bill is that it would contradict provisions within the European Union Withdrawal Bill Later Act. So the difficulty you've got is under the European Union um, Withdrawal Provisions, it would be possible for Westminster to enact regulations to say we need common frameworks in this particular area. So although this is an area that would normally be able to be legislated on by Scotland, actually we're going to enact a regulation to say there needs to be a common framework here and that will put this little area of power into the freezer. So you put it on ice. So basically for a, 
uh, a period of time, Scotland will not be able to legislate in this particular area, but Westminster will be able to do that instead and enact these delegated legislation to transfer things across to Westminster. And although Section 12 um, says that this will be done with consent, um, it's one of these areas where consent is defined in an odd way, in that no means yes. So uh, consent works as long as you've asked them and they've thought about it. And even if they say no, uh, that can still count as consent. Uh, it's an odd definition of consent, but there you go. Um, the Scots, understandably, didn't particularly think this was consent, which is why they enacted Section 17, which would have required consent in these particular circumstances. So that sets our understanding of why we're dealing with this problem with Section 17. But the difficulty we have is whether Section 17 is out with the powers of the Scottish Parliament. And we've thought about this in terms of, is it out with the powers? Because in some sense, it is contradicting the Scotland Act. And that's one route. And that comes through the route where you're saying, OK, Scotland can go away and enact legislation, but what it can't do is to do something that would modify or amend or repeal certain aspects of UK legislation. And one of the things it can't modify, amend or repeal would be the Scotland Act itself, including Section 28.7. So if you enact something that's going to modify that, that's problematic. The other thing you can't do is to do something which will touch on the sovereignty of Parliament, because this is reserved. So reserved to the UK Parliament are there various constitutional issues, including the sovereignty of Parliament. So we have these two possible routes by which we can say Section 17 is problematic. And we end up with this odd scenario in which, in one sense, it's not touching on the sovereignty of Parliament, so it's OK. But in the other sense, it is impinging on Section 28.7, but we see Section 28.7 as a mechanism through which we preserve the sovereignty of the Westminster Parliament. So you read these two aspects of the judgment, you begin to think, hang on a minute. On the one hand, this is not impinging on the sovereignty of Parliament. But on the other hand, it is modifying Section 28.7, which is the provision which preserves the sovereignty of the Westminster Parliament. And you begin to look at this and think, I am very confused. I don't really quite understand how you can say both these things. And the Supreme Court tries to square this circle in these two paragraphs. So in the first paragraph, in paragraph 63, it's saying we don't think that Section 17 impinges on the sovereignty of Parliament. Why not? Because it does not purport to alter the fundamental constitutional principle that the Crown in Parliament is the ultimate source of legal authority, nor would it have that effect. Parliament would remain sovereign even if Section 17 became law. It could amend, disapply or repeal Section 17 whenever it chose, acting in accordance with its ordinary procedures. So, OK, there's no problem because even if you have Section 17, which says you must have the consent of Scotland, Westminster can just ignore it. And then it goes away and says, OK, so what about this idea that you're modifying Section 28.7 then? And the Supreme Court says in its next paragraph, the preferable analysis is that although Section 17, if it became law, would not affect parliamentary sovereignty, yes, you just told us that, it would nevertheless impose a condition on the effect of certain laws made by Parliament for Scotland, unless and until Parliament exercised its sovereignty so as to disapply or repeal it. It would, therefore, affect the power of the Parliament of the United Kingdom to make laws for Scotland, and so modify Section 28.7 of the Scotland Act. Now, if you're reading those and thinking, my brain hurts, then, then join the club, because that's exactly what I thought when I was trying to understand these two contradictory provisions. So I'm going to try my best to explain what I think they're trying to say. And I may be wrong, but let's give it a go and see if we can justify what they're coming, where they're coming from. So in some senses... This is to do with understanding why there might be a condition. Okay, 
So we're saying, on the one hand, it's okay because Westminster can just do something to ignore Section 17. On the other hand, we're saying it's got to go through some kind of processes. So what they're basically saying, Parliament is still sovereign, but it's just now shifted to a different version of sovereignty because in some sense we've allowed it to have restrictions on how it enacts legislation. So that's one possible way of reading it. Still sovereign, Parliament is still the ultimate lawmaking authority, so it can get out of these restrictions, but there might be some kind of special arrangements, and we might allow it to say that it can't do various things. So if it wants to get out of Section 17, it's going to have to do something, ask Scotland, or it's going to have to enact something that would impliedly repeal it. Except it can't just impliedly repeal it, Maybe it can't imply the repealing because the Scotland Act is a constitutional statute. And so as a constitutional statute, it cannot be impliedly repealed, and maybe the Westminster Parliament would have to expressly repeal this particular provision. The other way of looking at this is to say, well, is this a different element to a manner and form? You might think, what is she talking about this time? Well, look very carefully about what Section 17 would require you to do. Because what Section 17 would have required Westminster to do is to get the consent of Scotland. And that's not really best understood as a manner and form, so a particular process about how you have to enact legislation. That might be better understood as redefining Parliament. Because it's not just that you have to go through a particular process, you're essentially saying Scotland has to give its consent as well. So is this a redefinition element? Do we deal with redefinition elements differently? The other way of trying to think our way through this conundrum is to see it in terms of sovereignty and legislative supremacy. So what we sometimes mean by sovereignty is, are you the ultimate lawmaking power? Westminster is the ultimate lawmaking power. Hence, you get paragraph 63. It's not impinging on the sovereignty of Parliament. Parliament is still the supreme lawmaker. It still is the supreme body of making laws. But it might be impinging on its legislative supremacy because it might be imposing conditions on how it has to enact certain forms of legislation. And so, therefore, when we look down paragraph 64, Section 28.7 says, well, they're imposing conditions, and so that is affecting the power of Parliament to make laws, but it's still sovereign because it still makes the laws in that area. Might be another way out of that particular conundrum. Another way of thinking about it is about time, and there's a lot going on in this um, case that is about time and the importance of timing. Because are you looking here at at this moment in time, Section 17 would be imposing a constraint in how you make laws in some way because it's saying go away and get consent. So at that time, it is affecting the lawmaking power of Parliament, even though Parliament could get out of that in some way, shape or form in the future. So there's various possible ways of trying to square this bizarre problem and conundrum. I'm not necessarily sure all of them are convincing but I'm just throwing them out there so you can have a think about how we deal with this particular issue. The second point I'd like to talk to you about, uh, Professor Elliott has already touched on, and that's the difficulties of conventions. Because we often talk about conventions and we say, well, it's okay to have these conventions because even though they're not legally enforceable, they are politically enforceable. There are effective political means of enforcing conventions. And I think what this whole scenario is throwing up is that may only be true for certain types of convention. And you need to think very carefully about who is it this particular convention is actually trying to regulate. Because when we're thinking about conventions like individual ministerial responsibility, we can see a potential mechanism through which you can hold ministers to account for their actions. You have aspects within Parliament 
So you could ask questions of the ministers. You have departmental select committees that can go and investigate what a minister is doing. And this can all then be reported on and the media can pick it up. And it could give rise to pressure to force a minister to resign. So we can see there are mechanisms for enforcing that particular convention. When we go away and look at the Sewell Convention, it's very difficult to point to effective mechanisms. Scotland can go away and say, I don't like this, I'm not going to give you legislative consent. And then Westminster has to turn around and say, oh dear, well, OK, we'd better take that on board and modify the legislation. Except how much is there going to be any form of political pressure on Westminster to achieve that? There are Scottish MPs in Westminster who can raise this. There could be issues from the House of Lords that could raise this that come through from um, the Scottish Parliament. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what is the sanction going to be if Westminster decides it's not going to comply with that particular convention? So I think it's making us ask deep questions about when we are dealing with conventions and we say they need to be resolved politically, how effective are the mechanisms to make sure that those conventions are upheld? And if you can get out of these political constraints, do we need to think more carefully about whether there should be other ways of enforcing conventions? And it's all well and good for the Supreme Court in Miller to say this is supreme high constitutional importance. But if that's coupled with no form of legal backstop, if you breach it, how do you ensure this is properly enforced in certain circumstances? The third um, element I'd like to raise that I think is important for the Constitution in this particular judgment is building on points about how devolution works and getting us to understand that when we're dealing with issues of the UK Constitution, you can't just think about law divorced from politics. You have to think about law, you have to think about political practice, and you have to think about the internal rules of Parliament if you're going to have a full understanding of how any particular aspect of our Constitution works. And to try and illustrate that, I want to build a little bit on the different reactions of Scotland and Wales. So we know that Scotland refused to give consent, but Wales eventually did give consent. But in order to understand that, we need to understand a little bit more about what was going on in the background. So there is a Welsh continuity piece of legislation. It was even in force for a few months. Um, it came into force in June and it came out of force in November. And the reason it stopped having force was because there's a particular section in the Welsh version of the continuity bill which empowered a minister to essentially revoke the legislation, which they did. So why did Wales take a different track? And was their track more successful? Partly because Wales is in a very different political situation. So while Scotland essentially voted to leave, uh, remain, I'll get it right, Scotland wanted to remain, so this, this tells you how confusing Brexit is. We can't remember what we're doing from one day to the next. Um, Scotland voted to remain, Wales voted to leave, which gives you a different political backdrop to what is going on. Scotland might be quite willing one day to go down the independence route. There is less political will in Wales to go down the independence route. So that gives you very different ways of working out, well, how do I express I'm not particularly happy about this particular piece of legislation? And a lot of what Wales was doing was exercising what we call soft power in the background. So there would be meetings between ministers of Westminster, members of the Welsh Assembly, and there's been lots of discussion and deliberation at that level. And eventually, you, if you go and track it through, you'll see there was a government statement with regard to its enactment of Section 12. It said, well, we've basically had to talk about this, we've had some discussions in the background, and we don't think there's a real need for us to go away and exercise our powers because we don't think there's necessarily going to be any legislation that is going to cause issues with these common frameworks. So it's like in the background, you're negotiating and coming up with a solution and then once that is in place, 
you have the ministers deciding that we don't need the Welsh Continuity Bill anymore. Whereas Scotland is in a different position, was less able to collaborate in the background in some senses, more willing to almost push the nuclear button and threaten the possibility of independence. So when you're dealing with how devolution works, you've got to think about the political realities as well as the legal structures. And I think if there's any lesson for the Westminster Parliament from this case, it is to think much more carefully about collaborating. And that brings me back to my final point about timing. Because when the legislation was initially challenged to the AG reference procedure, you did know about a very obscure subsection that adds the European Union Withdrawal Act to the pieces of legislation that can't be amended by Scotland. But it wasn't necessarily a piece of the European Union Withdrawal Bill that got a lot of discussion in Parliament. We were far too busy discussing other elements. So it was just sitting there waiting. And the timing of this meant that when you brought the challenge, it may well have been within the scope of the powers of Scotland, with the exception of aspects of, of Section 17. But by the time the law was going to come into force, the European Union Withdrawal Act was in force, which meant that a lot of the provisions that Scotland wanted to act differently could now no longer be enacted. So the timing of this and the fact that it was the UK government that was able to bring this challenge legitimately makes you realise that there are perhaps legal mechanisms in the hands of Westminster to be able to enforce its will in a way that there aren't the same ability in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland to push back, particularly in Northern Ireland where there is still no government. So I think it's giving you an understanding of the law and the politics and timing and the reality of how devolution works. I think that's the only comments I want to make about the Constitution. I'll now hand over to Dr Daly. Thank you. Well, thank you both. Um, I should preface my inflammatory remarks with a couple of government health warnings. Um, first of all, I'd be looking at uh, this case from a comparative perspective. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just that um, uh, in terms of understanding the intricacies of the UK's devolution arrangements, um, comparative law, as we'll see, uh, might not be that helpful. Um, secondly, um, I'm a little bit more interested in the big picture than in the intricacies of the devolution legislation. Um, I just want to make one more introductory remark, um, which is about, uh, it follows on from Professor Young's comments about negotiations behind the scenes. Um, one of the difficulties with um, these pieces of legislation, and indeed with the Brexit-related legislation in general, such as the Agriculture Bill, the Trade Bill, the Immigration Bill, is that they highlight the extent to which Brexit is blind. Um, they highlight the extent to which there is no government policy about what the post-Brexit United Kingdom will look like. Um, what you see in the Trade Bill, the Immigration Bill, um, are broad enabling provisions to enable power, uh, to enable policy to be made at some indeterminate point in the future. And it's very difficult, uh, I think, for the central and devolved governments to negotiate about which policy areas should be dealt with by Westminster and which policy areas should be dealt with uh, in Cardiff, uh, in Edinburgh and in Belfast when you don't know uh, what you are ultimately trying to achieve. And they all agree that there should be a unified United Kingdom market um, for some goods and services, um, but we don't know yet what the content of that United Kingdom market is going to be. Um, and that creates a serious problem of legislative and constitutional design. And you should have that in mind when um, reading about this case and about the withdrawal uh, arrangements more generally. So I'm going to make uh, two broad points. One um, about comparative law, looking at this decision from a comparative perspective. The other about the relative timidity of the United Kingdom Supreme Court 
in the area of devolution uh, relative to other uh, uh, areas it has been very active in. So first, from a comparative perspective, I want to make four points. I am, despite the accent, also Canadian. Um, and I spent many years in Canada, and I'm a member of the, the Bar of Ontario. Um, so I know a bit about Canadian constitutional law. I also know a little bit about American constitutional law. And Canada and the United States are federations. You have different levels of power. You have federal power, and you have states or provinces, which also have legislative power, power to make laws. And so my understanding of what courts should do or what I expect courts to do in a situation where you have multiple levels of lawmaking authority is first, uh, I expect it to be teleological. Um, if you've done European Union law, you'll know that the European Court of Justice is famous for its teleological approach. It looks to the broad underlying purposes of the European Union in order to interpret specific provisions. The Supreme Court of Canada uses what it calls the living tree doctrine, that the Constitution of Canada is a living tree which is growing and must be nourished by the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court. Now go and look at paragraph 12 of the Supreme Court decision in the continuity reference. The ordinary meaning of the Scotland Act is what matters. It's just like any other statute. You read the text. You don't look to the broader underlying objectives. That's, from a comparative perspective, very unusual. Now, it's not, it's not novel in this decision. Um, there is a, a constant line of authority in the devolution cases in this jurisdiction which say that you have to read these statutes um, by reference to their ordinary meaning. And so it's not a novelty, but it is odd from a comparative perspective. The second thing you would expect to see from a comparative perspective is judicial sanctioning the judges being comfortable with the idea of overlap between the different jurisdictions, that both levels of government can legislate on the same subject matter. The Canadians call this the double aspect doctrine. So you might have a particular type of problem, um, regulation of uh, advertisements on television, for instance, which might have something which the federal level can regulate, but also some things that the provincial levels can regulate. But there's the broad point is that there is a level of comfort with the idea of overlap and the idea that you might have different regulations uh, at different levels. Now, you do have some of that in the devolution um, jurisprudence, and you see some of it uh, in this case. If you look at paragraph 99, you will see some of it. But when you get to the provisions that Professor Elliott outlined, uh, where the Supreme Court held, and indeed the Scottish government, the lawyers for the Scottish government accepted that Frankovich damages and the general principles of EU law are inconsistent with the Withdrawal Act, from a comparative perspective, that conclusion seems quite odd. It seems quite odd that you wouldn't allow the Scottish Parliament to provide for these extra remedies, to provide for slightly different, um, uh, slightly different uh, structures for uh, the, the place of, of EU law in the, uh, the Scottish system. Um, you also see at paragraph 51, uh, there's a discussion of what it means for there to be a modification of a provision of the Westminster Parliament by the Scottish Parliament. And that is not a definition that's all bad. Uh, it's, uh, it gives a significant degree of power to the Scottish Parliament and the other devolved assemblies 
to make their own provision in areas they wish to. Um, but it is still much less empowering of the devolved assemblies than, say, the Canadian approach. It's much less generous to the, to the devolved assemblies than the Canadian double aspect doctrine. The third thing I would expect to see is a recognition that it is not all or nothing, that you can have, again, the federal level or Westminster saying one thing and also other levels saying slightly different things, as long as they're not outright contradictory. But in the devolution jurisprudence, and indeed in the, juris in the devolution legislation, it's all binary. It's all or nothing. The Scottish acts of the Scottish Parliament are either law or they are not law. Law or not law. And each of the individual provisions are either law or they are not law. And that, again, is slightly unusual from a comparative perspective. In other, in Canada, uh, certainly, where there is a conflict between a local, a, a state or provincial provision and a federal provision, the federal provision will trump. But it doesn't mean that the provincial legislation ceases to exist. It still exists. It's just in inoperative to the extent of any inconsistency. Uh, whereas here, you have a system where it is all or nothing. Either an act and a provision of an act of the Scottish Parliament is law or it is not. It's a binary choice. Uh, and that is slightly unusual from a comparative perspective. The fourth thing, um, which is unusual from a comparative perspective, is in countries where there is a federal system. Again, you've got a federal level and you've got other levels. The courts tend to see themselves as guardians of the Constitution. They tend to see themselves as standing up for constitutional values standing up for the constitutional settlement, standing up for the balance of power between the different levels. This is very well put by Chief Justice Marshall of the United States Supreme Court in a case called McCullough and Maryland in the early 19th century. And he says, we must never forget that it is a constitution that we are expanding. We are interpreting a constitution which is designed to serve the interests of the nation. And that's very different from the crabbed and narrow approach that the UK Supreme Court takes. The Supreme Court of Canada, as well as its living tree doctrine, also has a set of unwritten constitutional principles. The rule of law, federalism protection of minorities, democracy. And these unwritten principles provide a constitutional architecture which the Supreme Court maintains and the federal and provincial governments are expected to contribute to. The UK Supreme Court um, has not been especially fulsome in its embrace of the devolution legislation, and it has not positioned itself as a guardian of the Constitution in this area in the way that other apex courts have. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that every Supreme Court should be a guardian of the Constitution. Sometimes this goes horribly wrong. The United States Supreme Court uh, some people would tell you, caused, or partly caused, the American Civil War uh, with its decision in a case called Dred Scott. So you can get it wrong when you're being the guardian of the Constitution, and I'm not saying uh, the UK Supreme Court necessarily should be the guardian of the Constitution. I'm just saying that it looks odd, from a comparative perspective, that it refuses to take on that burden. Well, that leads me to my, my second point, 
uh, about the relative timidity of the Supreme Court in this particular area. And again here, it is helpful to have regard to the bigger picture. The bigger picture here, uh, sections 8 and 12 of the Withdrawal Act, is the power exercisable by ministers, so in other words, civil servants, they have the power to alter the scope of the authority of the Scottish Parliament. And as Professor Young has demonstrated, while the Scottish, uh, while there is provision for consent, the meaning of consent in this context is rather unusual. Now, with my Canadian hat on, again, this seems extraordinary, that you would have ministers at one level of government altering the scope of the powers of another level of government is absolutely remarkable. And that is the, the broader canvas on which the Supreme Court was painting uh, its decision in this case. And that makes its relative timidity and its resolute adherence to the ordinary meaning of the Scotland Act all the more remarkable. And if you think of other areas, the UK Supreme Court has been much more aggressive. It has seen itself as the guardian of the Constitution. In the Miller case, it saw itself as the guardian of the balance of power between Parliament and the executive and individual rights. And it engaged in an interpretive exercise which was extremely creative. Some people would say flat wrong. But at the very least, it was very creative. And uh, you could certainly see them as being motivated in that case by a concern to stand up for Parliament's role in making fundamental constitutional changes. You will also have studied the decision of the Supreme Court in HS2 Alliance, where they spoke of constitutional instruments, Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, the Human Rights Act, the Constitutional Reform Act, the European Communities Act, in the context of making a profound claim about the hierarchy of constitutional norms in the British Constitution. Are there some norms of British constitutional law which trump even European Union law? Again, uh, uh, nothing timid about the analysis in HS2 Alliance. Um, in terms of the Supreme Court's development of a body of common law constitutional rights, there has been no timidity at all. And in fact, even though there is the European Convention, as incorporated by the Human Rights Act, 1998, in a series of decisions, Osborne, Kennedy, the Supreme Court has insisted that the common law, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, retains its vitality and vigor. Again, no timidity there. And again, the Supreme Court positioning itself as the guardian of fundamental constitutional values. Not so here. In HS2 Alliance, when they were listing the important constitutional instruments, they did not mention the devolution statutes. Now, there, there was another case. It's a case called H and Lord Advocate, where Lord uh, Roger uh, talks about uh, the um, fundamental constitutional nature of the settlement affected by the devolution statutes. So it's certainly on the radar. Um, but you would be hard-pressed to say that the Supreme Court has been a champion of constitutional values in the area of devolution. 
And I'll conclude with another big picture point, because this really is a big picture point. And it is informed by having some experience of the Quebec secession movement in Canada. For most of us in this room, Brexit will be a life-defining event. It is probably, for most of us, the most momentous political and legal event that we will live through. But for some other groups, an event like Brexit is merely a point on a much longer historical arc. It's that way for the Irish Republicans. You don't see the Sinn Féin representatives at Westminster rushing to take up their seats to vote on the withdrawal agreement. Why? Because they are interested in a much longer arc of history. Same for the Ulster Unionists. <clears throat> and the same, also possibly, for the Scottish Nationalists. And decisions like this one, again, looking at the broader picture, looking at the ability of ministers to alter the scope of the devolution settlement, it is a grievance. And it is a grievance, which is, in my view, a, a, a legitimate grievance, and one which will be nurtured over time and is unlikely to be forgotten about. Um, and whether the Supreme Court likes it or not, uh, it is an actor uh, in the broad arc, uh, the broad arc of history. Um, and it is worth remembering that when Section 12 of the Withdrawal Act came to be debated in Westminster, when there were amendments put down to Section 12, there were 15 minutes of debate. And the leader of the Scottish National Party was ejected from the chamber because of his protests, and he was followed by other members of the Scottish National Party. That's in the background here. Um, and what uh, Mr. Blackford, who's the leader of the SNP at Westminster, said to reporters after had, he had been ejected was that this is the beginning of something, not the end. Against the broader arc of history, we will see where we end up. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers. Now we have a bit of time for questions. So does anyone want to start us off? 